Oh yeah, no, be good. Oh yeah, I'll keep my eye out for that. Mapbox and Icon Map are my go-to places for mapping. Yeah. Oh, me too. Me too. If only the ArcGIS map was slightly better, because it's got so much potential. But it has, it has. Yeah. But I don't think they want to stimulate that because they want you to buy the mm. product. Yeah, and it's quite expensive. I've got a license. Quite expensive. Yeah. But. yeah. I think within the board of directors, fifty percent is pro and fifty percent is against. Ah, uh, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> So, if you don't mind, yeah. I think it's time to start. Come on. Uh, so, I'll, I'll, yeah. Uh, did you... Okay. Actually, I didn't hear your last words. Okay. So, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, Alice. It's a great honor to host you as a speaker. With your permission, I would like to um, share my screen and make a little bit presentation. And as you may know, uh, New Zealand Educational Platform, so called Enterprise DNA is uh, a sponsor of this meetup group and it, it gives two full access uh, to the uh, attendees of uh, uh, meetups that are organized by Power BI, Excel, and the Innovate Rate with meetup group. So I will just identify two of our winners. So it will take roughly a maximum five minutes and then stage will be yours. I, I think it's okay for you also. So with your permission, I would like to share my screen. And I believe that uh, you see uh, my just say screen. Okay. Yes. So once again, welcome everybody to Buck Power BI Excel and Innovative Educators Meetup Group's fourth session in 2023. Uh, and uh, I would like to introduce our agenda of today's session. Uh, so I will put a little bit of information about our sponsor, Enterprise DNA, and then I will talk about just two books that I have translated into Azerbaijan language, uh, and also a little bit of information uh, about Developer Week 2023 that is going to be happening in uh, April this year. And of course, our session will start. And at the session, uh, at the end of this session, we'll have DNA. Uh, so, uh, enterprise DNA is a great place where, uh, for people who want to improve their uh, skills regarding uh, Power Platform um, products, including Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, and also. Uh, uh, other, for other tools like R language, uh, Python, so on and so forth. And, uh, and today, Enterprise DNA will give two full access to, uh, to the selected, the randomly selected uh, attendees of previous uh, session. Uh, so we'll do it a little bit later. Uh, as you may know, this year, uh, I, I'm, me and my friend for us, uh, from Saudi Arabia, who is MVP. We organized my data summit 2022, and most probably, and I still believe that we are going to organize this meeting, but this time in hybrid format in September, uh, circled my data summit. And it, it will be very great to see you also there. And uh, as for books, uh, I have translated financial modeling in Excel for dummies. It's all about Excel and also financial modeling. And the author uh, of this book uh, is lovely Daniela Steinfeld, who is coming from Australia. And it will be available in the, in the second half of April in Azerbaijani bookstores. And the second book that I'm translating and which is going to be completed uh, at the end of April is Master Your Data. It's all about Power Query and the author of this book is lovely campus who is coming from campus and Miguel Escobar and campus is coming from Canada and I'm not sure but Miguel Escobar is coming from Peru I'm not sure but uh, from South America is coming from okay uh, so uh, as for the over week uh, this is uh, the, one of the biggest events regarding uh, developers and it's going to be happen uh, on 26th and 27th uh, April of 2023 and uh, members of uh, Baku Power BI Excel and Innovative Citizen Group will have an opportunity to join to this event 
free of charge. Actually, the necessary information uh, have been sent to the members of my meetup group. So, as for today's speaker, we are going. We uh, have guests from speaker from uh, Australia, uh, Elias Drummond. And I hope I can pronounce his her name correctly. And she's going to talk about our BI um, reports for public tips and tricks. I hope in the next minutes she will be giving the more information about this topic. And uh, these are people, are my next speakers throughout the year. In April, I uh, will go on with Olena Grishenko, who is also coming from Australia. And then we'll have Natalie Renders from the Netherlands, Sonia Ayas from Australia, and Alexandra Swart, and so on and so forth. A lot of speakers from uh, Australia, by the way. Then uh, all my sessions are recorded. You can find the recorded versions of my meetups on my YouTube channel, just uh, youtube.com at Yutaisal Bayer. This is my address where you can find all the recorded versions of my meetup sessions. So now it's time to define our winners. Um, it will take only just uh, two minutes. So let me uh, switch to Excel files. So here uh, we have all the attendees of previous uh, previous sessions, previous session. And here uh, I have my participants uh, with uh, unique participants with their uh, attendee duration. And they, um, this is my average uh, duration, roughly 40 minutes. So people are going to be selected uh, who have attended the previous session more than roughly 40 minutes. And here I have my draw list with the names, unique names. Okay, and uh, there are uh, 23 attendees. Two people will be uh, just uh, selected. So I'm just going to press F9 uh, and uh, I will count back from three and then I will stop. It's very possible that uh, one name uh, will be appeared uh, two times. If this case happens, I will uh, draw once again. I hope we will be successful in, from the first time. So let's get started. I'm pressing uh, F9 and I'm starting count, counting uh, three, two, and I'm releasing my fingers, one. So these are people who uh, are the winners of today's, uh, uh, say, who are our today's winners, and they will be contacted through uh, our, uh, I mean, through our meetup. So, and they will be awarded with uh, uh, one year full access for enterprise gaming. So, uh, my congratulations. And this is uh, all uh, from my side, and I would like to uh, just uh, stop sharing my screen and I would like to deliver stage to Alice Drummond. So stage is yours. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for that introduction. And that was probably one of the best uh, wild card draws I've seen. That's very cool. I liked how you could see it kind of scrolling through the suspense in Excel. <laughs> Very cool. And um, just before I dive in, just another plug for Enterprise DNA. Um, no affiliation here, but that is where I went to learn Power BI like four years ago. The courses there are really practical, really amazing. Um, and I think it's just uh, expanded. Uh, so it covers all areas of Power Platform. Um, so congratulations, lucky winners. Um, and thank, thank you, you everyone for dialing in today and uh, joining me virtually um, to present at this meetup. Um, so today the topic is going to be um, kind of my Power BI tips and tricks and lessons learned on how to design your Power BI reports for public facing audiences. Um, so for those of you who I haven't met, I see a few familiar faces uh, in the audience in the chat room. Um, my name's Alice Drummond. I'm a Microsoft MVP for the data platform uh, based in Australia. Um, I've recently moved from the East Coast where I was in Melbourne, uh, back home to Perth in the West Coast of Australia. Um, before um, I transitioned into the data industry, I was also a water resource engineer. Um, so at Discovery I, um, I'm co-founder of Discovery I with my husband, Christian. Uh, we specialize in Power BI, uh, for the environmental and water industry. 
And a bit of a fun fact is we are celebrating Discovery Eye's fourth birthday today, um, which is a really exciting milestone. Um, so hopefully we've got many more years to come. Um, but yeah, we've really been enjoying the journey so far. Um, and I also run the Power BI for Enviro's virtual meetup group. So if we have anyone on the call today who's interested in using Power BI for the environmental industry or interested in seeing um, maybe a couple of different use cases uh, out there for Power BI, um, then feel free to join our meetup. Our mission's really very similar to this group here. It's to share different case studies, learn new tips and tricks, um, but really to empower people in the environmental industry um, to really adopt and take up Power BI. Um, but over to today's session, I want this to be as interactive as possible, as can be possible uh, in a virtual room. So please, if you have any um, questions, I'll stop after each uh, kind of demo. I've got four kind of bigger demos to go through today. Um, and I'd love uh, any questions, please feel free to go off mute um, or uh, type them in the chat as well. Um, but today what uh, we want to chat about is creating Power BI reports for the public. Um, but first, why would you want to create a Power BI report for the public? Uh, most people use Power BI internally within an organization. Um, and uh, it's a really powerful tool. It's all linked up uh, to lots of your office apps and things like that. Um, but it also, there's also a really great opportunity to create reports for public facing audiences. And in our experience, Power BI works really well um, to complement maybe traditional written reports. So say your company produces um, a written document. Uh, we know that scrolling through thousands of pages of PDFs <laughs> isn't really that engaging for the public. Uh, you could create a Power BI report, like a, a report snapshot to summarize the key taking, key findings or takeaways from those reports. Um, you could use it to automate your reporting if you're doing monthly reporting, which you have to share online. Uh, make your data a lot more interactive as well. Um, so lots of the projects that we've worked on is uh, creating um, interactive mafic, uh, maps, inter interactive graphics, uh, incorporating lots of media into it, uh, like videos and things like that, to really make uh, your reports or traditional reports a lot more engaging. Um, so here's a couple of examples of reports which I'm going to chat through today, uh, which we've designed for public facing audiences. So these reports are all online um, and I can share the links in the chat as well. Uh, but before we dive into the nitty gritty, um, I've got it just a short video just to show you and kind of whet the appetite of uh, what type of Power BI reports um, we've created for public facing audiences. So you can see there's a lot of emphasis on really clean design using corporate themes and branding um, to create that kind of uh, brand recognition. Lots of images and icons, a lot of text actually to try to help public audiences interpret this information. Uh, the use of uh, maps, images, infographics to really try to create that emotional connection um, to the data. And um, yeah, just lots of ways to make a lot of information interactive. So presenting lots of different data sets all on a page. So that's a quick intro. Let me just get through the next slide. Um, but before you dive into the kind of demos and the practical um, applications, uh, before you get started um, thinking about uh, creating a Power BI report for the public, um, I've summarized here just a quick kind of checklist based on my lessons learned of previous studies. Um, so the first uh, thing to think about before you dive in and create a public facing report is, have I selected the right option? So there's a couple of options we've got available for us uh, when working in Power BI for the public. Uh, think, have I tested my visuals across all different browsers? So Internet Explorer versus Edge, Chrome. Am I incorporating my corporate branding and styles? Uh, can non-technical audiences understand what my report means? Is my report intuitive to navigate? Have I incorporated accessibility into the design? 
Um, there's a lot of different questions you can ask, um, but you could also think about, have I considered report performance, mobile responsiveness, security, managing embed codes? Um, there's a lot of things to consider if you're creating a report for a client um, and you're wanting it to be a public facing report embedded on their website. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of um, the different uh, items on the checklist now, um, and then I'll dive into more of the front end visualization demos. So the first step is assessing our options. So when we're talking about creating public facing uh, reports, uh, we've got two kind of main options. We've got Power BI embedded, and we have Power BI publish to web public version. Um, so this is the version which I'm going to uh, show you today. This is the version that we've used on all of our different case studies. Um, the big difference between these two options um, is with Power BI embedded, um, you can almost uh, kind of take out a lot of the Power BI branding and use the different uh, visual components, um, almost like an app style. Um, it also comes with a, it, it is, uh, quite a bit more expensive. You have to host it on uh, on Azure, um, but it is a lot more uh, flexible. You have more options with it. Uh, but the Power BI published to web, uh, this is a really neat option. Um, all you need to uh, create this is a Power BI Pro license, um, and it's really simple to set up and maintain. Um, so that's what I'm going to walk through today. A consideration is uh, just be really careful whenever you're creating a Power BI published to web report, be 100% sure that the data is in fact public and you want to share it with the public. So this isn't a workaround for creating a Power BI report that you want to share with one or two people who don't have a Power BI license. Uh, published to web is creating a public report. So just um, uh, kind of keep that in mind. If you're working in an organization um, and you're wanting to create a Power BI uh, published to web report, uh, it's always a good idea to chat with your Power BI admin team. Um, they have the ability to shut down Publish to web uh, for the entire organization through their tenant settings. Um, and they probably want to do this for good reason, um, because they don't want people to go out and inadvertently create reports which can be accessed publicly. So always talk to uh, your admin team. Um, but how do we actually create this? Um, uh, I'll quickly show you a, just a real quick demo of how you'd go about creating your Power BI published web embed code. Um, so let's pretend that we've created a really nice report. Um, here I've got one, I've published it up to my online service. Um, so this is in, um, this should all be really familiar to you for people who use Power BI internally. To create that publish to web embed link, uh, all you do is you click on the report and under embed report, we've got this publish to web public button. Um, so this gives a description of what we're creating. It also gives you an extra warning to make it clear uh, that once your report is published, it is public. And it's about as easy as that. Uh, once you click the button, we've got success. Our report is ready to share. So we've got a, um, a link here that we can copy and paste it into a browser, which I'll do in a minute. Um, it also gives us an iframe, so some HTML code where you can embed your Power BI report inside of your web, web page. So I'll show you a couple of examples of that as well. Um, you could also bring in placeholder images. If you've got a report which is a bit slow to render, uh, this is a good option to bring in a placeholder image as like your front cover page. Um, it just means that it loads a lot faster. And you can also select uh, what default page you would like rendered. So it's as easy as that. So I've copied that uh, link we just created. And we can paste it into a web browser. And you can see that we've got our report now. You don't need any Power BI Pro license to access it. I could embed this in uh, my website and things like that as well. I could share it with clients and uh, the public.
Um, but a couple of things to remember uh, when you're creating reports for the public is to think about browser testing. So publish to web is not the same as a Power BI service. So some of your visuals might not render. Um, and also just because you don't believe in Internet Explorer, it doesn't mean the public won't use it. So this isn't a complete list. This has probably changed over time, but this is based on our experience, kind of what common visuals work in the Power BI service uh, versus good browsers we've termed anything any modern browsers so edge chrome uh, and then we've got a separate column for internet explorer um, so one of the visuals which caught me out once was using mapbox mapbox doesn't render uh, or it previously didn't render in internet explorer but it does in other modern browsers um, some of the AI visuals, uh, they don't render in publish to web. So I'll show you an example of that. We've got one of, I think we've got decomposition tree in this report. And you can see that in this publish to web version, the AI splits aren't supported. So there's a lot of different things like that that you might not be familiar with when creating these public reports if you haven't used um, the publish to web so much. So just keep that in mind. Um, so there's some of the practical consideration and the mechanics behind, okay, how do we uh, create this embed code? How will I kind of share it um, and, and things like that? What I want to go into now, which will be the bulk of the presentation, is more about designing your Power BI reports for public facing audiences. So thinking about the look and feel and interactions and presentation of data. And one thing um, which is really important uh, to consider and remember is when you're creating reports for the public, um, your end users, so the end audience, uh, doesn't usually have all of that extra contextual information uh, that internally uh, your teams might uh, kind of know about when you're creating reports for specific groups of people. So designing reports for the public means designing for a lot of different audiences. Um, and also when you're designing reports for the public, um, you're usually designing it for, say, a company or a brand, uh, whether it is uh, like a government client or it could be enterprise DNA. They've all got their own kind of uh, familiar branding and styles um, to adhere to. So there's a lot of different considerations like that. Um, so I'm going to take through four different reports that we've created for the public now, uh, point out a couple of the different design tips and techniques, um, and then give a couple of quick demos. Uh, were there any questions at this stage before I dive in? I'm just having a look through the chat. I think it's all looking good. Uh, uh, up to now, there is uh, no question, but uh, there is one comment from uh, Anthony who, is, who says that not a great advert for Microsoft. Microsoft items not working in their own browser, something like this. But this uh, is the question. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think the Internet Explorer is deprecated. Uh, so Microsoft is not supporting it. Um, but people, uh, especially government organizations um, in Australia, some organizations are still transitioning off it. Uh, but this, like, yeah, the, the visuals do work really well in Edge. Uh, which is the new <laughs> supported browser. Um, but yeah, a little, little bit of irony there. <laughs> cool. So the first example, which I want to chat through today, um, is a Power BI report we created for the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning in Victoria to visualise the Victorian water grid. Um, so one challenge about this study was uh, the client wanted five different individual Power BI reports, all embedded on their website. Uh, to present a wide range of different uh, data for urban, rural, environmental, and kind of traditional owner information. So we've got a lot of different audiences, five different reports, um, all embedded on the one website. So I'll just see which one it is. So it's this one. I might copy this in the chat if anyone wanted to, to have a look through and ignore the photo. Sorry, that's Christian's. <laughs> we share one Zoom account. Um, Cool. So this, um, you can see here that we've got five different Power BI reports embedded on this website. Um, and you can see because we've got so many reports, Power BI does take a little bit of time to load. 
So what we've done with this, with the publish to web, is we've actually used uh, the placeholder thumbnail image here uh, to allow the page to render a bit faster. So you can see that we've got an image and if we click view interactive content, then it loads the report. So that's a bit of a tip if you're creating reports um, uh, where your report is slow or it might take a little bit of time to render. Um, and you can see that we've used lots of different types of visuals. Here we've got like an infographic map to show the major rivers, uh, pipes um, and waterways across Victoria and present data or information about those. Um, but one thing I want to point out here in this example is the consistency of the branding and the look and feel of the reports. Uh, because we're embedding it inside of uh, the Victorian State Government website, um, you can see that we've been very much aligned with their corporate brand and styles. We're using a very similar colour palette here. Um, so we've got shades of purple and grey. Um, and also you can see their logo has a triangle in it. So we've tried uh, to incorporate that into like our Power BI background here. So it looks really, really consistent with, uh, uh, with the kind of branding and style. And this is something, this is a technique which is fairly um, uh, simple to incorporate into Power BI. And this is one I wanted to chat through with you now. So I'm just gonna go over to my Power BI desktop here. And here we've got a synthetic example report, um, having a look at a healthy waterway scorecard. Um, so uh, this is data just for demonstration purposes only. Um, but what I wanted to point out here is I wanted to show you how we can incorporate that corporate kind of branding and the look and feel and the colors um, simply by adding a really nicely designed background to our report. Um, so if we have a look over here, I've got some files. Um, you can see here that I've got uh, just an image file of a Power BI background. So this I simply designed in PowerPoint. You don't need anything fancy. Um, it's just layering lots of different shapes on top of each other. And we can add backgrounds into our Power BI reports um, by making sure we've got no visuals selected and clicking on the canvas background under image. We can bring our image in and we can just fit it to the canvas. So these ones, we just have to change the text color here so that we can um, see it against the background now. And you can see that it just makes such a big difference. Um, something as easy as uh, incorporating a background just makes your reports look um, a lot more kind of polished and you can get some really, really interesting designs um, by using this technique. Also within Power BI, we've got the ability to design a custom theme file where you can bring in all of your corporate uh, colors, fonts, um, and really itemize how you want the visuals to look on the canvas. Um, so this would be something I'd highly recommend uh, customizing if you're working with, uh, if you're designing a Power BI report um, for a company, they would uh, most likely have a corporate brand and styles guide with um, information on what their, what colors you should use, as well as what font types and things like that. So that was my first example. Um, there's obviously a lot of different uh, other techniques in there as well. Um, but the second example I want to chat through today is an example uh, which we worked on for the Gippsland um, Water Corporation. So having a look at designing their Gippsland Water Urban Water Strategy in an online interactive format. So traditionally, they release uh, their urban water strategy as a PDF document. Um, this could be anywhere from 100, I think it's been like 300 pages in the past, uh, to really present an overview of 24 different water and sewer systems. Uh, they've got a lot of maps, uh, very technical information in there uh, to really try to communicate um, what their plan is for managing water across the region in the future. So again, there's a lot of information we're presenting. Um, the design tip, which I want to point out in this example, is the use of images and icons. So we really want to design for those non-technical audiences um, and really try to 
bridge the gap between um, uh, like kind of the engineers on the ground who know this data very intimately um, and then presenting it for just the public. So I'll show you an example um, through a couple of the visuals. Let me find it. Not that one. It's this one here. So I'll copy this into the chat if anyone wanted to look through it. Um, so you can see here we're being consistent again with um, trying to align with the brand and styles guide. Now, uh, this time we just created a very simple background internally within Power BI. Um, and one of the heroes of this, uh, of this report is this nice icon map here. Um, so if any of you who joined the call a little bit earlier, you might have heard uh, myself and Paul just chatting about all the different mapping options in Power BI. Um, icon map, it's a custom visual created by James Dales, uh, hands down my number one favorite mapping visual in Power BI. Um, and one of the reasons is because it allows you to incorporate icons onto the map. And icons are really um, great for communicating to more kind of public audiences um, because it allows you to uh, present your data using symbols, um, which is a lot more easier to communicate. Um, you might also notice in this report um, our use of images. So here we're not just describing um, a water supply system like the Latrobe system. Uh, we've got a description in words, uh, but also we've got lots of different images here um, so that the public audience can see what this um, uh, system looks like and have a look at the key infrastructure within, within this region. Um, and we've also got uh, embedded infographics to de describe these systems um, in more kind of pictures. So if we have a look and we'll click on learning more about our treatment process. Here we're using another custom visual. This time this is the synoptic panel um, to present these infographics. And we can click on the little hand icon and it tells us a little bit more about what this um, treatment process is about. So really we're trying to hear design for the public um, to show them uh, kind of in pictures and symbols and words and images, uh, what these different systems look like. So you can see you can present lots of different uh, infographics here. Um, so they're the different techniques I'd like to point out uh, in this example, the use of icons, images and infographics to really try to communicate uh, your message um, at a glance and for those non-technical audiences. Um, so I'll just head over to Power BI and just show a quick demo of how different options of incorporating these into your reports. So back on the same example here, um, we've got a lot of different options for incorporating images and icons. So the first one I want to do is bring some icons into this slicer visual here. Um, here, it's not just any old slicer, we're using a custom visual. Uh, it's called the chiclet slicer. So this allows us to combine um, images with our text, uh, which makes it a little bit easier for uh, people to slice on. Also makes it a bit more interesting. So if we drag in this icon here into the image, um, you can see that now we've got uh, these nice images to slice on. And we can also bring some uh, images into these two matrices here. So I'm going to bring my image into my column header here. So you can see that it just really uh, helps communicate um, at a glance what these different elements are. Um, and then lastly, we've got this uh, another custom visual. This is one of my favorites again, the card browser. Um, so the card browser, uh, it allows us to combine um, images or photos uh, with titles and text descriptions. Um, so I use it a lot in our dashboards to present things like case studies. Um, this is where we showed the photo gallery of the different water infrastructure. Um, and it's really easy. You can bring in all of your different information and then just add in an image. And adding the image in just makes all the difference, I reckon. You can also add this little thumbnail icon as well, like a badge icon. Um, 
but yeah, it's a really neat visual. Um, I might have skipped over uh, the images. If people haven't incorporated images into Power BI before, you might be thinking, but how do we get these? We're just dragging it in uh, from a column in a table. Uh, within Power BI, um, and ignore my <laughs> very messy demo. This has a lot of different demos in it. Um, within Power BI, the best way to visualize uh, images is with an image URL, so an image hosted online. Um, and you can see here that we've got our images hosted online. Um, I'm using IMGBB, which is a free image hosting service, and this is great for public reports. Um, you have to make sure if you're designing a report for the public uh, that the images um, can be publicly accessible as well. Uh, for example, if you're designing a report internally, um, say it's a HR report with images of uh, maybe your staff personnel, uh, those images might be saved in something internally like SharePoint. And that SharePoint site uh, most likely isn't available externally. So if you're creating a public facing report and you're storing data on something like SharePoint, just make sure that it can be accessed uh, by all public audiences. Um, another really good image storing spot is Azure Blob Storage. That works really well as well. Uh, there's a ton of them. The key thing is just host it online and bring it in like this, and then you categorize it as an image URL. Oh, are there any questions on uh, what I've covered? Uh, just that I see there's quite a few things in the in the chat. Well, actually, uh, I asked it myself to a question and. Uh, yep. um, uh, let me, for, okay, uh, Alice Drummond, I mean, Yoko, um, I mean, uh, someone helped me with one uh, question. It was related to just, uh, so there are two questions. Let me read them. The first one is how can you use Power BI's data driven alerts feature to keep viewers informed of changes in data trends or metrics? That was the first question. And the second question was, how can you ensure that your Power BI reports are accessible to users with disabilities, such as those who use screen readers or have power reader deficiencies? And the second question has been answered, but the first one is... Okay, yeah, yeah. And I'll touch on um, color blindness, so color vision deficiencies um, as an example. I think that might be next. The first one, Power BI's data-driven alert feature. Um, is yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not on, on top of, of that feature. Is that like um, I know with like uh, if you have a dashboard, you can uh, create alerts off tiles and it can notify people. Uh, what's the data driven alerts feature? Uh, some uh, changes happen in the data source, for example, you join to some data source, right. Well, oh, yeah. Data, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's a good question with a public facing report. Um, it would it would work uh, internally. So if you're creating a report and say you're connecting up to lots of different uh, data sets, uh, then you would still get it's still like exactly the same. You're creating a report, publishing it in your online service. Uh, you will get the alert uh, then because it's reading data from different uh, data sources. Uh, but when you create it uh, published to web as the uh, step after that, uh, then the Power BI report, uh, that report, like it, it doesn't, um, it wouldn't uh, have anything uh, in the report, I'm, I don't think, or it would, uh, but you have to be really careful. If you're creating a Power BI published a web report, you want to make sure that it is error proof. So if you are connecting to live data sets and, you're, and it's constantly updating and refreshing, you don't want your uh, live report, your public facing report uh, to error out. So thinking about error handling in that is really uh, important. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Uh, no, yeah, you asked. Thank you very much. Uh, taking it an opportunity, I would like to ask one uh, last question. First of all, it's really pity that I forgot uh, at the beginning of the session that you, I'm studying your materials regarding environmental analysis. They are very wonderful, very good, you know. 
And oh, thank I you. Hope yeah. I still struggle to believe that in the next three months I will complete all these materials. But my question is related to data sources. Is there any data source where uh, we can get the necessary data regarding uh, countries? For example, I'm interested in water reserves of Azerbaijan. Is there a general uh, data source? For example, in my country, uh, I don't know, and I'm not sure that there is such a, uh, say, um, source uh, where mm. uh, I can get it. Is there any general, say, data source or? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, I'm familiar with the Australian uh, data sources. Um, so a lot of the different individual states have their own data, which is published. Um, and we've got the Bureau of Meteorology collating all of Australia's water resource information and data sources. I do know that the World Bank manages a lot of international data sources. I haven't had a look at any of the specific water resource uh, related data sources. I do know they're very, very patchy. Um, so it has to de be dependent on uh, the type of data which they're monitoring to make sure like lots of countries that uh, don't have it for that. Um, but no, I'm not sure with the water resources. But interestingly, um, the Power BI uh, Gartner Bake Off for this year, which was just released, I think, earlier this week, this was all focused on uh, flooding impacts. Um, so that uses a global data set and it looked really, really interesting. Um, so that could potentially be one, uh, which might be of interest to you. But I, if you're looking at water resources, um, no, I don't know, unfortunately, what uh, if there is a global data set. Um, but yeah, really yes, good question. You, uh, Anthony, Anthony has shared one link. It's really oh, the World Bank one. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Anthony. Oh, so there are um, two examples. Um, the third example I want to chat through um, touches on a topic uh, that Ilga mentioned, um, and this is accessibility. So designing your reports for all different audiences and considering accessible uh, design into that. So incorporating things uh, like uh, colorblind deficiency. So thought about choosing appropriate colors for all audiences, uh, but also making sure your report is easy to understand, uh, easy to navigate, uh, things like that. Um, so the example I wanted to chat through today is one which we worked on with uh, CSIRO, uh, which is a scientific body based here in Australia, um, to present uh, the findings from the social, cultural and economic uh, values survey uh, conducted on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so this is really the objective of this report was to communicate uh, the findings from this survey data. So we're not dealing in kind of... Uh, uh, it's much more qualitative data this time in Power BI um, to a wide range of different technical and non-technical audiences. Um, so I'll have a look at the at the dashboard now. Let's go back online, see if we can find it. Not that one. And yeah, this one. So there's, a, there's two different Power BI reports um, embedded in their website. So I might just send a link here. Uh, these are the dashboards on the CSIRO website. If um, anyone was interested in clicking along through it as well. So there's two of them, uh, but I'll just take you through one today. So you can see here we're using very similar techniques. So icons on the buttons, just to give it a little bit more kind of interesting uh, aspects to it. Um, also the branding, we've got the CSIRO colors. We can click through here. And you can see that we're using um, buttons and bookmarks uh, for our navigation. Um, this is between different pages. This is on the page itself. Um, and we're presenting the survey data here. Um, we can filter the data for specific regions or genders or age groups and things like that. Um, but what I wanna point out uh, in this example 
is um, the choice of colors. So here we've got a red green color scale on uh, this visual here. Um, and red and green are um, notorious for being uh, a kind of poor color choices from a colorblind perspective um, because red green color blindness is quite a common uh, vision deficiency. Um, but we've chosen uh, the hues of these colors um, slightly uh, differently uh, so that they can be uh, distinguished uh, for the major types of color blindness. Um, also, this image, this visual here, if you're looking at trying to figure out what is that visual in Power BI, uh, this is actually a Deneb visual. So this is a custom visual uh, created using uh, the Deneb custom visual. So that's coding in Vega and Vega Light, uh, created by Daniel Marsh Patrick. Um, so we're super lucky at Discovery Eye to have Daniel on our team. <laughs> so he's the author of the visual. So wherever possible, we try to uh, slip in Deneb visuals. Um, but Deneb visuals are really, really good if you're creating a public facing report and you've got a visual uh, design which your audience is used to seeing. So something like this for kind of like a sentiment survey chart. Uh, our client had a very specific way they wanted to visualize this information um, and designing in a visual like Deneb uh, that allows you to um, create a really customized visual that the public will understand. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are very lucky to have to have DMP on our team. Um, yeah, he's amazing. I think Enterprise DNA have a couple of videos or courses on Deneb as well. Another shout out to you guys. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different techniques here, but in this example, I want to highlight uh, the kind of choice of colors. So let's have a look at a different uh, demo. So this time I'm going to switch over here. And this is an example of an, another environmental scorecard created in Power BI. So again, this is just for demonstration purposes only. Um, we made up the data, I think, <laughs> uh, just to suit our purposes. Um, but here you can see that we're using color across a lot of different aspects of this Power BI report. So we've used it to uh, indicate uh, the environmental health score. So we can see it in the legend here. We're using the color on the map. We've got it in the on hover tooltip. We've got it in this in this table here. And even if we drill through, we've got it all on this other page as well. So this color is used extensively across um, our dashboard. But if we go online and have a look at this website here, coolers, these are the colors that I'm using on that dashboard. And Coolers is great. It's a really good design uh, tool. It allows you to um, choose different colors. You can view the different shades. Uh, you can bring a logo in and pick all the primary colors and things like that. Uh, but one of my favorite features it's got is the colorblind check. So we can see for all the major types of uh, colorblindness what the actual colors would look like. So you can see that this palette is really terrible. We can't distinguish between good and bad. And because we're using color throughout this dashboard, um, this wouldn't be a really good example to share publicly. But if we have a look at a slightly modified color palette here, here you can see we've still got red to green. If we have a look at this, we can see that we can now really clearly distinguish between these different colors. Um, so just the slight change in hues can make all the difference when it comes to accessibility. So luckily, we've designed this report with a lot of conditional formatting. So I've conditionally formatted um, the uh, visuals based on their colors reading from an Excel sheet. So this is a really good technique if you're using color in multiple places across your dashboard. Uh, try to create a supporting table which has your um, fill hex. Here I've got my font hex codes as well. Um, and this allows you to update the colors really, really quickly. So you can see that at the moment it's linking to this non-colorblind safe colors. But if I copy in my colorblind safe colors here, 
and I'll just save and close this. And then just refresh. What one is it? I might just refresh everything. I think this is a super small file. Hopefully the colors will change. Working on it, awesome. So you can see that wherever we've got color, um, it's now changed to those uh, uh, colorblind safe colors. Um, and now this report's a lot more accessible for, um, for different audiences. Are there any questions on this? There is one question. It's a little bit different. You can check if you don't mind. Uh, okay. I think it is it from Paran. Yeah, so does Power yeah. BI natively provide or plan to provide accessibility suggestion features similar to what is available in MS Word and MS Excel? That's a really, really good question. Um, at the moment, I haven't seen accessibility um, kind of prompts pop up across Power BI. Um, and I am not sure if I've heard anything in the uh, kind of blogs and release plan. Um, I do know that we've got within Power BI, uh, there are accessible themes. Um, so we can we can uh, toggle those on. If you're viewing reports in the online service, there are a lot of accessible features there. And we do have accessibility scattered throughout the different visuals. So we can put it um, under uh, kind of the properties. We can put our alternate text and things like that. We can make it dynamic. Um, we could also do under the selection pane, we've got the tab order for the navigation, the keyboard navigation and things like that. But I haven't seen any of the um, prompts pop up uh, like in PowerPoint or Excel. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, does anyone else on the call know if, have just, they seen that? Just to say, Alice, from my point of view, is when I was at SQL Bits, I asked a question like this about accessibility in the new sort of layout design of visuals, and they didn't say that they were going to be adding in a feature like that, certainly in the short yeah. term. Okay. Yeah. And that's a really good point. Um, yeah. I've, <laughs> I think I've got the March version on this computer, but I haven't turned on the preview. I'm still getting my head around the new visual uh, formatting. I think it's going to be great. I just have to get used to it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately then, um, yeah, it is, it is something that maybe the onus is on uh, the report designers at the moment. Um, but hopefully with all of these AI features and chat GPT and uh, auto or co-pilot <laughs> coming about, maybe it will become a lot more um, automated or uh, prompted for us um, because it does come I mean, up everywhere. I did, I did put a link in a chat. Stephanie Bruno has just come out with a accessibility checker PBIT oh, file awesome. that you can use. I've just put a link in the chat to a GitHub earlier on. And there's actually a Workout Wednesday challenge on changing a report to be accessible to people. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to check that out. Um, that's awesome. Cool. But accessibility covers a lot more than just color blindness, but I think um, just keeping it in mind, and especially if you are creating public facing reports, um, then there's a lot of different options uh, in Power BI that you can configure. Alice, I've got another question on, on your custom yeah, visuals. I noticed you use a lot of custom visuals in your reports. Yeah. Do you, I mean, obviously I know you said right at the beginning of the testing and stuff. Do you do a hell of a lot of testing then to make sure that those custom visuals don't break? Because that's mm. the concern that I often have with custom visuals. Yeah, that is what I'd like to be honest, in the past, uh, I think CloudScope had a couple of image visuals, which we used. We didn't use for any client reports, but we did use for our internal, uh, like, marketing reports. We made an AFL dashboard with images <laughs> that when they got deprecated, the report broke. Um, so that is a caveat. Uh, we do use a lot of custom visuals on our reports, but we tend to use exactly the same custom visuals 
on our reports. Um, I tend to go with ones which are certified. They might be uh, more likely to be keep being supported in the future. Um, but yeah, that is a risk and it's all about communicating it to your clients uh, that what you are designing now, uh, you're designing it for the current version of Power BI and the visuals and just making it aware that uh, Power BI it moves at the rate of knots. So even it might not even be a custom visual. Some of the changes to the buttons and things caught me out on a few reports. Um, so it's just about making your clients aware that this product does change. Um, and maybe having a support contract in place that if uh, a visual is deprecated or uh, a new update to Power BI does not uh, push all the features forward, uh, like they're no longer compatible, uh, then it's just making that making that known. But that's a really, really good point. Um, the visuals, yeah, we do we do kind of test them, but um, yeah, as I mentioned, we use a lot of the same visuals, uh, so you just have to treat them with a grain of salt or like reach out to the visual authors to see if they're maintaining them. Uh, the last example I want to talk through today um, is an example we worked on with the Greater Melbourne uh, Urban Water Corporations. Uh, so it's Melbourne Water, Yarra Valley Water, Southeast Water and Greater Western Water. Um, very similar to the Gippsland Water example, uh, but this time to present the Greater Melbourne Urban Water Strategy. So the difference between this one and the Gippsland water was this one uh, contains a lot more um, high level information. So a bit less technical, um, no kind of really detailed infographics or maps. Uh, but this time they wanted to put a lot of information into the one dashboard. So the, the design tip I wanted to point out today was thinking about how you can design your Power BI reports so they're intuitive for people to navigate. Um, and also how to include instructions. So for this example, we created some how-to instructional videos and we embedded those into each page of the dashboard to demonstrate to users how to navigate through that page uh, because within this dashboard, our client wanted to put a lot of information. <laughs> so we had layers upon layers of bookmarks. Um, so I'll show you an example. Uh, but this could be a really good option if you're um, creating a little bit more of a complex report. So you can see here we've got the report. It's embedded within their website. This is an example of embedding a Power BI report as an iframe. Um, so we can click here to view in full screen mode. And I'll just go to any of these pages. On each page, when we click on the page, uh, it pops up a navigational video. And this navigational video, I'll just turn off the sound, but what it does is we've got a voiceover which provides almost like an executive summary of what that page, the key information on that page. But at the same time, it doubles as a navigation video showing the users how to click through each tab and an overview of what the different information presented within these tabs. So you can see that that popped up automatically when I navigated to that page. Um, but if we go back to that page again, you don't want that video shown again. So we've used some uh, clever kind of bookmarking techniques here um, to only show those videos once. So here we see it and then we exit it. And then if we go back to that page, we don't see it again unless we want to. And you can click on this bookmark prompt. Um, so that's a really good option to make sure that people can first discover those videos, um, but also that it doesn't get annoying. But you can see on this report, we've got a whole layer of different um, kind of types of information. We've got bookmarks here, bookmarks here, bookmarks here. <laughs> so it's super important for the end user to know how to navigate through. So I'll just exit this full screen mode here. I'll share this link in the chat if anyone did want to have a look. Yeah, and then um, I'll show you an example of how to embed videos into your reports. So here we're back on this um, example here, the catchment health scorecard. And what I've set up here is using a bookmark. So just toggle on my bookmark pane here. Um, is a placeholder for including a video. 
So to display a video in Power BI, um, the best way is to use another custom visual. Uh, this one's called HTML content. And HTML content, it does a whole lot of really cool things. Um, but one of them is it allows you to display uh, kind of media. So we've got um, a video which I've hosted online on Vimeo, which is a video hosting site. And um, here we've just imported the HTML code for that video. Um, if anyone is interested in knowing exactly what this code is and things like that, I've got a blog post, um, a pretty old blog post showing uh, how to do this. Um, but yeah, you just need to get the uh, video HTML code. And if we bring it in, we can now actually watch this video inside of Power BI. So it's as simple as that. Let's make it a bit smaller so it kind of fits. So you can see that you could create a really nice little navigation video. Um, if you want to have it as uh, in inside a bookmark, um, I've just used some groupings. So here I've just got a bookmark to show and hide different groups of visuals. You can see I just brought that into that group. Um, and we've just got two bookmarks, one to show, one to hide. Um, yeah, so it's as simple as that. Were there any questions on uh, videos? I see we've got one in the chat uh, from Pran. Uh, does the video have to be on a publicly accessible location or will it also work if the video is hosted on MS Stream or SharePoint page behind a corporate firewall? Uh, that's a really, really good question. Um, the answer is yes, it has to be publicly accessible. Um, and even if it is publicly accessible, um, it has to have certain, the website where it's hosted has to have uh, a certain um, uh, kind of website thing enabled. <laughs> uh, this is another, sorry for being not technical. Uh, this is another visual that Daniel Marshpatrick has created. So I've had a lot of conversations with him trying to get in, uh, videos uh, embedded in Power BI off YouTube. YouTube has something known as CORS or, yeah, I don't know what it stands for. It's C-O-R-S. Someone on the call probably knows a lot more than I do about this. Um, but what that means is uh, it's a certain, maybe it's a little bit like a firewall or it's the origin of the website, um, which Power BI doesn't support. So even if it is public, it has to get this extra uh, kind of tick through it. So the two ones we use is Vimeo. Vimeo works well. And also Azure Blob Storage, that works well. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, actually, you probably know much more about cores than me. Um, um, yeah, Alice, you also got to have cores enabled for yeah. doing certain things with some of the maps, uh, map layers I've discovered where you've got to do that oh, yeah. for certain things. Oh, good to know. Yeah, and it's not a visual specific thing. I think it's a Power BI thing. It's not even Daniel, a Power BI thing. It's it's often it's related to uh, certain other settings oh, yeah. that have oh, to be done. Okay. So, and I know that for like when I was working with GeoServer uh, with Icon Map and trying to uh, do ge GeoJSON layers and things, you had to have cores enabled on the actual serve on the actual web server itself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's scattered throughout. Um, yeah. So don't write to Daniel and complain that it doesn't work. And <laughs> yeah. No, I think, um, yeah, there's certain things like that you do have to be um, on top of. So I'd always recommend if you're creating, if you're wanting to create a public facing report for say a client um, at the start of the project, and if you're not sure you haven't been through this journey before, just put a lot of caveats in there and uh, don't, don't promise that we can do it. If you've seen it somewhere, I would say test, test, test. Always kind of test in lots of different uh, settings um, and things like that because uh, while it might be possible in the Power BI desktop, it might not work in the service. And while it might work in the service, it might not work in published or web. And while it might work on Vimeo, it might not work on YouTube. There's a whole series of things when it comes to this, um, yeah, that, just have to be uh, kind of careful about. Um, and Khalid asks, how are you managing to show the navigational video just once and not on the next visit to the same page? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what we've done there is, um, I'll go back to the example here. 
let's make it big. So if I go to the home screen here, when I, I've got here, we've just got buttons which take us to a bookmark. And if I click on one of these bookmarks, um, it's not actually a bookmark per se, but it is taking me to the page. So if I go back into Power BI Desktop and see here, if I click on this button under action, um, you can go to bookmark, actually. Oh yeah, so sorry, not a bookmark, it's a page navigation. Um, so I would click on a page navigation uh, instead of a bookmark. So I'd click on a page navigation and the page it wants me to take me to is the tooltip. So if I click here, it takes me to a page, not a bookmark. Um, and just before you publish that page, so before you publish your report, you just have to make sure that the video is displayed on every page. So before you hit publish, you make sure the video is displayed. So I have to go through and make sure on all the pages we've got this uh, shown and then you publish it. And then when you do the page nav, then it will go to that page and then you will just see what was shown on publish. And then when you exit it and then you go back, because we're using a page navigation, uh, then it will just show what's on the page. Um, and here we're using a bookmark to show and hide. Yeah, great question. Awesome. So there's so many more different techniques and lessons learned. Uh, think about things like report performance. People Alice, don't like to wait. Question oh, yeah. for Go myself for is what um, what software do you use for doing your videos and your sort of GIFs and things? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. So it really depends. I like, um, what's it called? Camtasia for videos. Uh, Camtasia is pretty good. Um, GIFs, if you just want to do a short little navigational GIF, screen to GIF is free. Um, so that's really good. Um, Camtasia has a big license. I think it costs, I don't know how much it costs. We get it free through the MVP program, except now I think we don't. Might have to pay for it. <laughs> um, there are other ones we've tried. Um, yeah. MCTs also have an opportunity to use free of charge. Camtasia. Oh, who does? Oh, MC Microsoft Certified MCT. Trainers? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so I think they must have an affiliation with Microsoft. So hopefully they continue it for that as well. Um, but yeah, there's a lot out there. Uh, I found Camtasia really easy to use. Um, think about mobile responsiveness. So for published to web, uh, unfortunately, the mobile design layout doesn't work. So people want to see responsive layouts. There are a couple of tricks. Um, none of them are very neat or good. <laughs> so just maybe include that as a caveat in your um, if you're creating this for a client. Um, security, that's really, really important. Is your data actually public? Can you share it public? So don't use publish to web as a means of getting around sharing reports with clients who don't have Power BI Pro licenses. Um, and then what we touched on earlier, maintaining your solution and managing embed codes. So just think about um, what you create today um, as raised by the questions. Some of the visuals might not be supported in the future. Um, think about if people refresh the data, but there's errors coming in, think about what experience that would be like for the public audience. So we typically create two Power BI reports, one for internal review and testing, and then a master one in a lockdown workspace. Um, and also think about managing your embed codes uh, as well. So at any time, your Power BI admin can go and manage it and they can remove your embed codes. Um, so a summary, Publish Web is really fantastic. It's an easy, um, almost free option if you've got a pro license. Um, we'd recommend taking a staged approach with uh, iterating and testing and designing your reports. If you're designing it for clients, uh, get stakeholders um, into the conversation early, especially if you're working with a media and communications team. They've got a lot of good ideas on how to make things look good. Um, but most importantly, engage with the report users. So try to get a lot of different stakeholders in the room, design it for lots of different audiences 
um, and then you can create a really good looking report for the public. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for dialing in. I loved all of the questions as we go as we went through. But um, yeah, I'm happy to hang around if there are any other uh, questions or comments or people want to share their experiences as well. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, I appreciate your support, your speech. I really learned a lot of things. I hope it's the same for others. So if anyone has questions, please, actually, uh, if you don't mind, at least you can stop sharing and everybody can turn his or her say, um, cameras just for networking, can ask questions so and so forth. So I think this is the best time and great place we can do it. <clears throat> so there is one more question, Alice, from Abu Bakr Ali uh, regarding ICOM Lab. Okay, oh, yeah, I see that. Uh, so for the icon map, what is your go-to option for layers, Mapbox, GeoJSON, or WKT? Um, yeah, so icon map, it's a really good custom visual uh, for displaying spatial layers in Power BI. Uh, my go-to is using WKT, uh, so that's well-known text for the layers. Um, and the reason behind that is it allows you to store it internally within um, Power BI, uh, which is sometimes the preference of your clients, um, means you can manage it easily. Uh, and it does render quite fast. So I think I've tried GeoJSON versus WKT, and WKT for me renders um, a lot faster. Uh, Mapbox, I do use for base maps. Um, Mapbox, it's a third party. Uh, online mapping platform. It has a really generous free tier. So I've only ever used the free account. Um, and you can create very quickly, you can create customized base maps using some of their out of the box, uh, kind of like open streets view uh, maps and you can add your own layers onto it. And within icon map, you can dynamically change uh, the base map. Uh, so I find that that, that works really well for me. Um, yeah, good point. WKT, you have to be careful about the character limits. Yeah, exactly. That's caught me out. If you have very detailed spatial uh, data, then because it's stored in Power BI as a text string, uh, then you have to um, be careful of that. Uh, the way I get around it, usually the way we're using icon map is more of a kind of presentation of of data um, for lots of different areas and they want it to be kind of infographic. So I just usually simplify and pre-process it. I find it renders faster that way as well. Um, but yeah, definitely depends. Um, another question is how do you manage multiple versions of Power BI reports during multiple iterations while developing the reports? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, because I because we do an iterative approach. Um, there are lots of different ways you could do it. I tend to just use uh, because we're a very small company. There's usually only uh, one or two of us working on the Power BI report at the same time, and we can kind of communicate that and then kind of merge them in uh, together. Uh, but then, yeah, I use uh, just kind of naming conventions and things like that. Uh, when I'm designing the reports and developing them, uh, I'm not sharing them typically with our clients as public, um, like public links. Usually I'm sharing them as um, a Power BI report, which you can share. Um, and sharing via an app works really well because you can see the different stages of development. Um, but yeah, that's one thing to keep in mind. If you're creating a report for the public, uh, when you publish it up to the Power BI online service, you don't you want it to have the same name. Otherwise, uh, it will create uh, multiple versions of that report, and you want to any updates you want to push to exactly the same one. So just think about your naming conventions um, and things like that. Uh, there's another comment by Paul. Yeah, you can split the column and concatenate in DAX. So that's is if you're using the WKT and you exceed the character limit. Um, yeah, you can do that. 
Yeah. Were there any other um, kind of questions or has anyone in the audience uh, used the Power BI published to web to create public reports? And have you got any other tips you've learned or tips you'd like to share? There's one more question from the podcast. Um, one more question. So uh, any limitations you have faced in terms of the number of rows that can be rendered for WKT on the map? Yeah, that's a good question. So custom visuals have, um, or visuals inside Power BI, they've got a limit. So it's not just the text string for WKT, but the number of uh, kind of data points you want to display. For me, I have run into this. I can't remember the exact number. I'm wanting to say 10,000 rows, but it might be more. Uh, Paul or Anthony, do you know with Icon Map uh, the number of data points it can display? Yeah, 30,000. 30,000, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So good to know. And I think um, that's, yeah, I think that's actually a Microsoft limitation. Paul, correct um, me if I'm wrong, but I think that's a Microsoft limitation that's put, been put in place. Yeah, I'm not sure really, Anthony, because uh, in, other, in other visuals, you'll find that it's either less uh, or up to 30,000. Oh, no. so, yeah, so and I think, I think yes, talking with Daniel, maps, yeah. They do a limit of 3,000 on many of the standard built-in maps, but I know James has pushed it out to 30. You can push it out mm. to 30,000 on, on icon maps. The only thing is, though, is that be careful because it can take a while. I've tried right. it with 30,000 points yeah. and it takes a while to render. It, it takes yeah. a while to render. Uh, what I always do is I simplify my shapes in Map Shaper, yeah. um, and then re-import them into QGIS. So I, I make sure that my points are uh, sort of stretched out. If you have many contours, you'll find that the rendering takes much longer. A hundred percent. Yeah, I definitely recommend simplifying where possible so you don't lose the information you need but yeah lots of detailed spatial files have multiple vertices i think chatting with daniel marsh patrick so he's a custom visual developer i think the limit um the custom visual author can overcome the limit as well so you can display two hundred thousand data points or something in a visual this is chatting like a year ago. I don't know if they've changed, uh, but most of the visual authors would uh, not override the Microsoft limits because of rendering issues. Um, but that's why maybe some of the custom visuals might have more, might have less. Um, but yeah, really good questions. And yeah, icon map. <laughs> if anyone hasn't heard of it and you're hearing all these questions, um, if you do a lot of mapping in Power BI, then uh, it's a really good option. Awesome. Were there any other uh, questions or um, or anyone want to share their experience with published to web? Has anyone done similar using Power BI Embedded? I just want to say one comment, Alice. So interesting your, your thing about report performance in the browser because there was actually an article I found the other day of somebody who had actually done, they were doing performance checking on some DAX measures and they happened to then mention about don't necessarily just do performance on your own desktop, try a different desktop and particularly try different browsers, which I never thought should even be an issue. But they said, make sure you check your performance in different browsers because they can vary quite a lot. And you had a table that varied so much for this particular report in terms of the browsers. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I do find uh, Inter Explorer timed out so much on certain visuals. <laughs> uh, so thank goodness Microsoft aren't supporting that. Um, but yeah, definitely your your desktop might be really super speedy and things like that, or you might have a really good internet connection. Um, yeah, the performance does vary based on different browsers, different devices. I know some of the fonts aren't carried through on uh, Apple devices uh, for some of our reports. So um, choose your fonts wisely. Um, I think it de defaults to Times New Roman or something, uh, which doesn't look so nice, but um, info is still there. But yeah, definitely, yeah, just test it. It's important if it's a public 
report. I think you can get away with it if you're designing a report internally within an organization. Um, usually the software is already installed on people's machines. They've got default browsers, which everyone uses. Um, but yeah, public, no, no guarantees. Okay, I just want to thank you very much. Thank you for your time, for your wonderful speech, presentation. So I think there is no question. So with your permission, I would like to end this today's session. And I hope and believe that we'll have you, we'll see you in next year or in next times as a speaker on behalf of what Power Bay Excellent Innovative Education Platform. So. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thanks, everyone, uh, for all of the interesting questions and comments. Uh, that was really, really good. And hopefully um, I'll see everyone virtually, I'm sure, at other meetups um, and hopefully in person uh, soon as well. Exactly. Why not? Maybe in September in Baku, in Azerbaijan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank possible. you. Have a good day, everyone. Okay.